Uh, as we said in our last session, chapter 5 is going to be a continuation. Just, just think of it as one letter not broken into chapters and verses as we have. I, I love it that somebody took the time to break it into chapters and verses. Because when I, I want to say to somebody, turn over there to Genesis 27 and verse 14, it's a whole lot easier than saying, go over here and find what this says. So, but you see there in chapter 5, if you look at our booklet on page 17, here's kind of a, a running look at what we're going to be looking at, the overview. Looking beyond this life to our heavenly home, Verses 10 to 16, judgment matters. And then the last five verses, 17 to 21, are reconciliation with God, reconciliation to God. I'm guessing, and I'm just speculating, that in the book of 2 Corinthians, some of the statements or verses that are most familiar to us out of the whole book are in chapter 5. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We must all stand before the judgment seat of the Christ, verse 10. Verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Yeah, those are really familiar things. All here in chapter 5. There's a song that I want to mention. And, and I think about it when I read the opening segment of chapter 5. And the song is, I know that my Redeemer lives. Well, one of the verses in that song goes something like this. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands. Most wonderful to see. Well, that language, a home not made with hands. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 1. For we know, wait a minute, the last three verses in chapter 4, he's talked about we don't lose heart. It's a light affliction. It's a temporary affliction. Our focus is not on things that are seen here, but things that are eternal. Verse 1, chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle or tent were dissolved or destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see what I think about that song? A house, a home, a house not made with hands. All right, now, in, in verse number one, when Paul speaks about this house or tent or tabernacle, He's not talking about the church building. What's he referencing here? Our body. Our body. That's right. So, group answer on, on question one on page 18 of the booklet. What's the earthly house slash tent tabernacle? It's our physical body. And there's a reference there. We won't turn over and read it, but, but Peter wrote about that. He used that same language. He said, as long as I'm in this tent or tabernacle, indicating the temporary nature of our physical body. He said, I'm going to keep reminding you. So, when this body, when we're done with this physical body, what have we got that's, may I say, out of this world? What have we got awaiting us? The eternal home. And you know, we could go on and on about the spiritual songs that have been written based on that concept. You know, the eternal home or city of God. Now, you go on in verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house or habitation, which is from heaven. Again, another song comes to mind. There is a habitation, right? Built by the living God. So let's look at our question number two, kind of walk through this one. I think when we do it this way, it helps us grasp um, you know, the essence of what Paul's saying. Question two, how does Paul describe the magnificent building to which we look forward? Building here, obviously, in a symbolic sense. Its source is whom? God. Came from God. 
It's nature. What kind of building is it going to be? Not made within. So it's not physical. Now back in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, this corruptible cannot inherit incorruption. When he said this corruptible, he had reference to what? This physical body. Decay and, you know. And the incorruptible would be the environment of heaven. This physical body is not suited for a heavenly environment. So, Paul said, we're not all going to sleep, we're not going to die, but we're all going to what? We're all going to be changed. So that we have uh, the type of body that would be suitable for heaven. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable and satisfied just leaving that in God's hands. That's not worthy of my frustration or losing sleep or heated debate about the type of body. The Lord will take care of that. I know this. We're going to have the type of body Jesus has. Now you say, what kind is that? I've never seen it. Okay. But it fits there. All right, now, we go on. What about its longevity? Eternal. Eternal. Yeah. And its location? Heaven. Or in the heavens. That's right. Exactly so. And we never want to lose sight of that. Now, Paul goes on to talk about being clothed. And there is such a thing in the Scripture as being properly clothed in, in material clothes that we put on our bodies. But there's also in the Bible the sense of being clothed, of being in a state of preparation. Okay? Um, when you look there in verse 3, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So I think it's a concept of prepared versus unprepared, ready versus not ready. You might remember the story Jesus told, and there's one fellow that's cast out of the feast because he didn't have on the proper attire. He wasn't ready for that. And verse 4 says, For we that are in this tabernacle or tent, that's now this physical body, we groan being burdened. Not that life is tough, but our longing is to be in a better place. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Just to real briefly look at question three. To what does Paul refer when he talks about Christian being clothed or unclothed? And again, I'm suggesting the word clothed here is the idea of righteous living or prepared for judgment. Well, to, to take the whole armor of God that we can stand? I think it would. Yeah, that we're covered in every place. I think so. Um, you know, it, Jesus summarized um, with this statement. He said, these, and he's talking about those who hadn't acted properly, these are going into everlasting destruction, but the righteous into life eternal. You see that contrast? Some in everlasting punishment, some in everlasting life, Matthew 25, 46. And he said those who are going into everlasting life are the righteous. They're in a state of readiness. And how are we ready for the Lord? Well, we're living in a righteous state. So the unclothed of the naked would be unprepared for heaven. It's not talking about the way we dress, although that could be a factor. Now, when we live on this earth, are we with the Lord or apart from the Lord? Brother Sid? We better be with Him. Because if you're not with Him, you're not. Right? There's that physical sense, right? In which he, we're here and He's at the right hand of God, right? So He's not walking on the earth with us in the manner that He walked in Galilee with the, with the disciples. Okay, That thought is brought out, I think, in verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident that whilst we are at home in the body, here we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Look at question number 4 in our booklet. While we live on this planet... We are at home in the body, but absent from the Lord in one sense. We greatly long for the time when the opposite will be true, where we'll be absent from
from what? The body and press it with whom? With the Lord. But there is, and we don't want to overlook this or minimize it. There is a sense in this life where God's with us. God's promise is if we live in the right way, He will walk with us and He will dwell in us. Like we read about Noah walking with God. But, but Paul in the context is talking about that time when we leave this world and go on to our reward to that home which the Lord has prepared. Now, verse 7 is, well, it's pretty easy to memorize. And once you memorize it, it's pretty easy to keep in mind and, and say it. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, remember that first word of that verse, I would think the first word in verse 7 is probably the most overlooked word in that verse. Because oftentimes we see ruin on, we walk by faith, not by sight. But, 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 wait a minute. What is for me? Because. So again, boy, I sound to some of you like a broken record. Some of you don't know what a broken record is, but I sound like that to some of you because we're going back to this idea. It's a connector. It's a connector back to that previous thought being in the body now, absent from the Lord, but we sure would like to be with the Lord. In this life, we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, unfortunately, some individuals have altered what the text says or have made a conclusion that's not based on the text. Some individuals' approach is we walk by faith, not by evidence. Some people's thought is if we believe in God or we believe in the Bible, we believe in Jesus or we believe in heaven, then we're just kind of fingers crossed going to the edge of the diving board and just hoping this works out. It's always biblical faith is always based on evidence. Why do we believe that God exists? Well, because there's evidence. If you don't believe it, September the 25th. Oh, no, I'm not asking you to come hear me teach on that. You go to your own congregation. But what we'll be talking about, you know, does God really exist? We'll talk about evidence. Why do we believe the Bible's the Word of God? Not because Grandma said so. We believe because of the evidence. Why do we believe in Jesus? Because of the evidence. We're, Jesus is no longer walking on the earth. Even when Paul wrote this, Jesus no longer was walking on the earth. And so they couldn't say, hey, let's go, let's go hear Jesus today and let's go see him do some miracles. Our faith is based on the evidence that, that God gives. So if you look at question number five, what's the difference in the following concepts? A is walk by faith, not by evidence. That's the idea that faith and evidence go, don't go together. Let me ask you something. I'm not trying to be tricky. I'm just trying to sort through this. When Jesus was on the earth and his disciples were living with him and for him, did they believe in Jesus? Yes? Yeah, they did. Did they see evidence from Jesus? Yes. So did their evidence kick out their belief? No. Their faith was based on that evidence. Um, sometimes the idea is expressed, I've got to fix that thing. If we need to, we'll take turns with our hand under it. Um, Sometimes the idea is expressed that if you know something, then you can't believe it. If you believe it, then that's, that means you don't know for certain. Well, let me ask you again. Did the disciples believe in Jesus? Yes. Did they know that He was the Christ? The answer is yes. 
Peter on one occasion confessed Jesus, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. And we know and are sure that you are the Christ. And so knowledge does not mean you can't have faith, and faith doesn't mean you can't have knowledge. Okay? Now, the next part is we walk by faith and not by sight. Our, our walk in confidence are not based on having the Lord physically present on the earth. You with me? Let me say it again. Our walk and our confidence, they're not based on having the Lord physically on the earth walking in step with us. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Again, I'm not trying to be tricky. Just trying to sort through this. In the first century, had every Christian seen Jesus? No. Look in your Bible. We won't speculate. Look in your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and at the end of verse 7 it talks about the glory, honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then Peter says whom having not seen ye, the ones to whom he's writing, you've not seen Jesus but you love him and you've not seen him but you believe. Was it possible for them to believe in and love a being whom they had not seen? That's what the text says. How could they do that? Because of the evidence. Because of the evidence. And that's our appeal to people today. Show them the evidence that God exists. Show them the evidence the Bible's the Word of God. Show them the evidence that there is a heaven. Okay? Now, let's, let's go on to the next section here. Um, in the context, look at question six. In the context of this chapter, this part of chapter 5, what does it mean to walk by faith and not by sight? Well, verse 6, we're absent from whom? The Lord. And in the sense that he no longer is physically on the earth. Okay? So it's not, our walk with him is not based on the material things that we see right now in this world. All right? It doesn't mean don't open your eyes and look at the world, but our, our walk with the Lord is not based on material stuff. But we're confident, verse 8, that there's going to be a change. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What would that indicate? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So I said, well, it's just an out-of-body experience. Well, we can do better than that. Well, I think it's absent from... When will we be absent from the body? When we die. After we leave this world. Okay? And we'll be with the Lord. You know, Paul even spoke in language to the church in Philippi. He said, he said, I'm kind of, and I'm paraphrasing or summarizing. He said, I've kind of got two conflicting desires. He said, on the one hand, I'd love to stay on the earth and, and work with y'all and help you. He said, but on the other hand, I'd like to go and be with the Lord, which is what? Better. It's better. Philippians 1 and verse 23. So there, there is a sense in which even before we reach the heavenly state, when people leave this world and go to Hades, there's a sense in which we're with the Lord. And that's what Paul was wanting to do. He wanted to be prepared at all times. Now then, with that in mind, verse 9, Therefore we labor, the New King James says, Make it our aim that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him or pleasing to Him. What do you mean present or absent? Whether we're still on this earth or left this earth. Okay? Paul's goal in every aspect was to be pleasing to the Lord. Look 
look at question number seven. I think we can get this one together. The goal of every Christian ought to be to be what? Pleasing to the Lord. That's right. That's the language of the New King James. Pleasing to the Lord or accepted by the Lord. I know. Easier said than done. So from that he begins to speak about judgment. And oh, sorry y'all. Here it comes again. Verse 10, first word, a connector. We must all appear. Is that a memory verse? Man, that's a good one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that just a few, no, everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. That is a verse that gives us quite a bit of information about judgment. Jesus said, the Father judges no man, but committed all judgment to the Son. Let's, let's, let's talk about a few things, and, and we've got a question number eight. Name three things. Now, if you don't like odd numbers and you want to do four, knock yourself out. Name three things about the judgment of humans which every person in the world needs to know and accept. We're going to be before it, the Christ is going to be the judge, right? It won't be Judge Judy, it'll be Judge Jesus, right? Not Judge Judy, Judge Jesus. There's no getting around, that's right. It's going to happen. We must appear. You know, in this life, there are some occasions you have an appointment, you can cancel, you can postpone. You can, in some form or fashion, weasel out. Nobody's going to cancel or postpone or weasel out of the judgment. How many judgments days are there going to be? It's called the day of judgment. And we know exactly when it's going to be. We just don't know when it's going to be. It's going to be on the last day. We just don't know when it's going to be. Okay? Now, what else do we know? We know it's going to be... Uh, before Jesus, we know it's going to be inevitable. What else? Based on the judgment is going to be based on what? So it's going to be individual, right? Based on what we've done in, in, in this life, not what we do after we leave this world. You know, some people, some people unfortunately have bought into the idea. Maybe they've just deceived themselves in some cases. They bought into the idea, ah, well, well, we'll worry about that when the time comes. Yikes. There won't be any second chances, right? There won't be any, let me fix this. I'll throw myself at the, at the Lord's feet and beg for mercy. No. It'll be justice. So, based on what we've done in this life. And, and what's the criteria, whether it be good or bad? Now, let's just Observe this real quick. In the song. Some people have have the idea apparently that at judgment the Lord's going to use some type of scales. And if you're good that you've done outweighs the bad you've done you should be in good shape. But if the bad you've done outweighs the good yeah, you may be in trouble. No, it's not it at all. In, in the language of the book of Revelation, John sees into this heavenly scene and one of the elders says to John, well, who are these over here dressed in robes of white? John said, do you know? What's the conclusion? It's those who have been washed in the what? Blood of the Lamb. That's what it's all about being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Or as we just read earlier, being clothed with righteous living. I had a person call me uh, two days ago. Never met this person. I, Donna and I went to visit her a few years ago and she wouldn't, I won't say she wouldn't come to the door, she wouldn't open the door. Co-worker of one of our members. And uh, She's promised a thousand one times to come to services, promised to stay. Well, anyway, she called. She was quite emotional. And uh, 
she was just afraid that the Lord couldn't forgive her. She said, I remember the church. We didn't talk about the plan of salvation, but she had this concern, and, and sometimes members of the church struggle with that. Sometimes the thought is expressed, I'm just afraid I'm not good enough. Heaven is not for perfect people, y'all. It's for people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there's a big difference in being perfect, that is, never make a mistake, and being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Does that mean that we can say, well, let's go out and see because we've always got the blood. We, no, no, it doesn't mean that at all. But as we walk in the light as He is in the light and have fellowship one with another, what does the blood of Jesus continue to do? Cleanse us, Cleanse us from our sins. And, and look, we're not in competition and the Lord doesn't grant a crown of life based on you did more than somebody else or you lose a crown of life because somebody did more than you. Don't beat yourself up with that. You'll be miserable your whole life if your approach is I've got to do more and be better than other people. We need to be the best we can be every day of our lives. And a gracious God is understanding when we make mistakes. So, so those mistakes, that, that those sinful things that we did 10 years ago, and you've repented of those 10 years ago, don't ask God today to forgive you of those sins. If I'm asking God today to forgive me of sins that I prayed about 10 years ago, then that sounds like I didn't really believe God forgave me 10 years ago. Right? So don't beat yourself up like that. All right. They are forgiven. And aren't we thankful that God is forgiven? Now, in that context, if you don't remember anything about this lesson, you'll remember the fours and the therefores. Maybe. Look at verse 11. Knowing therefore, stop. Paul's been talking about what? Judgment. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. What do we do? Because we know the terror of the Lord, we do what? Persuade men. And I think the context would indicate we persuade men, not to be a Vols fan or a UTC fan, we persuade men to get themselves ready for judgment. Okay. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay, so look at question nine. With what topic or activity is the terror of the Lord connected in this context and why is it appropriate to use his terror in our efforts to persuade people to serve him? So it's connected with what topic from verse 10? Judgment. Judgment. So my question is, not is it appropriate, but why? Why is it appropriate in some fashion, in some instances, to use the Lord's terror as a means of, might we say, getting people's attention? Well, why is that appropriate? What's your first instinct when I ask it? Well, why is that appropriate? Because judgment is final. Judgment is final. Okay? That, that's a great thought. Judgment is final. And if you don't approach it properly, any goofers in here, you don't get a mulligan. You don't get a do-over. Right? You don't get a do-over. And you have all eternity to regret that you didn't take it seriously. I wasn't concerned about the terror of the Lord. Boy, I wish I had been. What's another thought? Why is it appropriate to use the terror of the Lord? Well, I got two words for you. Jesus did. Jesus said, you don't fear the one who can destroy the body but not the soul. You fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell, Matthew 10, 28. And just as a way of observation, the word Gehenna for hell, it's used not that many times in the New Testament. Every time but once, the one who spoke about hell was Jesus. And so that's, that's one motivator. It's not the only motivator. But even in the Sermon on the Mount, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus used hell as a motivator, okay? What's the Bible say? It's a fearful thing to fall into what? Yeah. Hands of the living God. Well, that's true if you're unprepared, right? Hebrews 10 verse 31. So judgment is a fearful thing. This past Sunday, two days ago, we sang as an invitation song on Sunday morning, there's a great day coming. And then what else? What's another verse in that song? Not a great day, but a what? Sad, Sad day coming. There's a bright day coming. Well, what's the difference between that day being a bright day? Can't wait. It's going to be great. And... Sad day. What's the difference? Prepared and unprepared. On the day of judgment, the Lord's going to do some talking. And to some individuals, he's going to say, well done. Spelled S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S. Success. That's a Bible definition of success. At the end of life's journey, the Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To some people, he's going to say, what? Depart from me. Spelt F-A-I-L-U-R-E. Failure. Okay. So, as we read on in this context, hey, don't stop at verse 11 because the Lord's terror is not all that's involved, okay? That's not all that's involved because verse 14 talks about Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Am I seeing the word for again? <laughs> Go back to verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is of, of God, to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For, because the love of Christ constrains or compels us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, serious question, number 10. Name some things that the love of Christ constrains or compels us to do. First of all, if we can, let's start in the context. Let, let's pick out what is there in the neighborhood, so to speak, of verse 14 that the love of the Christ compels us to do. And then after we do that, and we've exhausted that, then we'll step outside of 2 Corinthians 5 and think about some other ways. Well, I think you go back to verse, the love of Christ, verse 14, compels us to talk to people, verse 11, persuade people about the judgment, verse 10. Right? When we sing the song, there's a great day coming, our thought is not, So the love of Christ. So what, now you got a combination. Verse eleven, you got the terror of the Lord. What does the Bible say? Behold, therefore, the goodness and what severity of God. Romans eleven twenty two. That, that two aspects of His nature. So the the, the terror of the Lord. Verse eleven, per, we try to persuade men to get ready. Verse fourteen, the love that we have for the Lord. And we're, going to, and we're going to see in verse 14, uh, one died for all. Who was that? His love compels us to be grateful. Well, what else you got besides telling people about the coming judgment? What, what else would the love of Jesus compel, that is, motivate us to do? Okay, because, you know, in Romans 6, Paul talks about you, you're going to be one or the other. You're either going to be a slave of sin or you're going to be a slave of righteousness. You choose and choose wisely. So it motivates us. I don't want to be a slave of sin. I want to be a slave of my Lord. Anybody else have a thought? Well, what is there about Jesus that his love would compel us to imitate? Forgiveness. His compassion. And if I may use the word again, what is it about Jesus' love that would compel us to imitate him? Uh, love. 
Okay, so yeah, Sister Jackie, I can tell that there's his sacrifice, his sacrificial spirit. Yeah. And, and of course, some of those things would go together. You know, going back to chapter four, think about Paul, everything that he put up with and went through and, and endured. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, it motivates us to stay faithful to the end. You know, in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, sometimes the life of a Christian is compared to a race. And the race is not just getting started. You got to start. But the race is not like a 100-yard dash. It's more like a marathon, right? And so the thought in Hebrews 12 is we run with endurance, perseverance, and patience. It motivates us. Now, let, let's go back to, to, to 14. Okay, And in the latter part of that verse, His love constrains us or compels us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Dead in what sense? Spiritually dead, okay? So why did one, number 11, why did one, the Christ, die for people who were dead? Because they couldn't, are we making up words tonight? They could not undead themselves. <laughs> they could not provide themselves with life. Right? Only the blood. What can wash away my sins? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He died for all because that was, that was necessary. We needed not just a sacrifice, but a perfect human sacrifice. Jesus came into the world. The world became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus became a human. Don't overthink it. Why did he become a human? What would you answer? Jesus became a human because he had to die physically. He didn't come to save mosquitoes and whales. He came to save humans. So he became a human. And he died for all. All were dead, you know, in, in sin and in need of a savior. And you know, one of one of our challenges is uh, convincing people that they need Jesus. You know, because it's it's not uncommon. To encounter someone, maybe they say it out loud, maybe they just think it, and we talk to them about the gospel, talk to them about the Lord, and they, their response is kind of like, I'm good. I got this. I'm good. I'm good. Or maybe, I, when I need that, I'll get back with you. So, one of our challenges is to convince people that they need the gospel and convince people that they need Jesus. When John the baptizer saw Jesus approaching, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which what? Takes away the sin of the world. Okay? Now, let us read. We don't have a question about every verse. Let's, let's read the flow from 15 down to 17. And watch out for the fours and the therefores. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There's that matter of what? Denying ourselves, right? Taking up our cross. Verse 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. I, I think it goes back to that idea of we walk by faith, not by sight, that he's no longer on the earth living among men. Therefore, you knew it was coming. Therefore, if any man be in whom? In Christ. He is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That, that is such a, uh, what's the word? Rich passage. The only place to be a new person is where? In Christ. And so that makes a person want to know, well, if all spiritual blessings are in the Christ, forgiveness, eternal life, no condemnation, that's all in the Christ, then a person should want to know the answer to what other question? How do I get in there? And the Bible answers that question. And the only answer the Bible gives is baptized into Christ. And, and the language of Romans 6 is, no, you know that as many of us are baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death. Talks about being buried with him and then walking in what? Newness of life. Where is that newness of life? It's in Christ. There's no such thing 
as being born again and not being in Jesus. You, you don't need to say, I'm a born again Christian. If you're a Christian, I know you're born again. If you're born again, I know you're a Christian. We don't say, yeah, that quarterback is a left-handed southpaw. No, oh, he's left-handed. He's a southpaw. He's a southpaw. He's left-handed. We don't say, yeah, that dead corpse. No, if it's dead, it's a corpse. It's a corpse. If you're a Christian, you're born again. If you're born again, you're a Christian. And you've been born into the Christ. Now, just for our conversating, okay? But number 12, what are some of the old things which have passed away. I, I, look, I, I seriously, we're not saying let's go around the room and talk about our former sins. I'm not into that. But in general terms, what old things would a person need to put off when they obey the gospel? Old way of life. Old way of life. And in Bible language, that person is the old man, or we might say the old meat. Okay. The old way of life is put off. The old focus was on me and self and what I want. We put that off. You know, Paul used the language. Paul was not one to, uh, to try to run away from the facts. He said, we, we were hateful and we hated one another. So we put those things away. Worldly speech, whatever. Now, what about the new things? Let's think on the positive. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's not talking about we're no longer under the old covenant. We're under the new. That, that, that was the theme of chapter 3. Here the thought is we're a new person. <clears throat> Mentally, spiritually. So what things would we have that would be new? Okay, eternal. New hope. Okay, new hope. What else? All spiritual blessings. Yeah, absolutely, a new a new relationship. We're no longer just friends. We're we're family. There's redemption. Uh, there's all. There also comes with that new responsibilities, right? It's not just getting into the Christ, but but living for Him. New priorities. You know, I, I spoke Sunday, you know, I mentioned about what hinders people from obeying the gospel. Uh, sometimes it's, well, it's, it's just not that important to them yet. There's something in their life, maybe not be sinful. It may be something that's a wholesome activity, but they're just not ready to give that up. They're going to keep doing that and they're not coming to services. They don't have time for the Lord. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a change. Now, the, the last section, as we've labeled it in our chapter, in our booklet, is 17 to 21. It's talking about reconciliation. What is reconciliation? In life, don't, don't, don't think about spiritual matters, but just in life in general, what does it mean for two individuals or two groups to be reconciled? I, I started to use my hands to do it. I'm not doing that. What does it mean to be reconciled? They come together. In a lot of cases, we think about come back together. Here, here's a couple dating married. Here are two groups, and they were together, but now they're, in our language, at odds with one another. The Bible's message is, what does sin do to a person's relationship with God? Separates. If you're having a Bible study with somebody, please don't stop at that point. At least in the study by showing them Romans 5 or someplace where it says we can be reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That, that's good news. That, that's a better place to end the study. Now in this section, let's read about this reconciliation. And so you see the verb reconciled and the noun reconciliation many times. Verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, in the sense that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So I got a ministry of reconciliation, verse 18. I got a word of reconciliation, verse 19. And then verse 20, I've got ambassadors. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ 
as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be what? Reconciled to God. So if, if we don't mention it, keep this in mind. Verse 20 is written to Christians. And so the end of that verse is an appeal for them to continue to be reconciled to God, to, to stay in that continuous state of walking in the light. What's your first word in verse 21? Well, the very idea. For he hath made him, context him as whom? Jesus. To be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Let, let's quickly look at a couple of, and I think these are pretty straightforward facts. But number 13 in our booklets. God's plan to reconcile man to himself was by whom does God reconcile man to himself? Jesus or Christ, verse 18. Okay, not, not the best worded, but uh, Jesus is the answer. The ministry of reconciliation is the service of helping others, what? Be reconciled to God. It's not marriage counseling. It's the service or the help that we give to others to help them be reconciled. Well, how do we do that? How do we help somebody be reconciled to God? You say, well, get out of the way. Let me make your choices for you. No. How do we do it? We teach them the gospel. And then the choice is theirs. Okay. What about the word of reconciliation? I mentioned in verse 9, you said we got this word of reconciliation. That's not reconciliation, reconciliation, and reconciliation. What would the word of what is the word that brings humans together with God? The gospel. God's word or the gospel. That's it. That's it. Now. You know what we're not going to do? We're not going to put on the gloves and fight over the word ambassadors. The word ambassador is used two times in the New Testament. And according to Mr. Thayer, it means to be an elder, talking about age, to be an elder or eldest prior in birth or to be an ambassador. Now, I, I'm not going to look over your shoulder. I'm not going to argue with you. A lot of people uh, speak about all Christians being ambassadors. I, I'm not convinced in the context when Paul talks talks about us as ambassadors or we are ambassadors. I'm not convinced he's talking about all Christians. In the context, I, I'm, I'm of the persuasion he's talking about the apostles because he says, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled. And so it sounds to me like Paul's making a distinction between himself and some others and those to whom he's writing. We know this. and We'll, we'll not have any um, disagreement on this. The apostles had delegated authority, right? They had delegated power. And so just, are we to be teaching the gospel? Yes. But when you think about an ambassador of the United States, that person has within that position, what does he carry with him when he goes into the office of a prime minister on foreign soil? the authority behind him from the U.S. government. And, uh, and again, if somebody says, I think all of Christians are ambassadors, I'm not even going to, I'm not upset. I don't think they're doofus. I, I just don't think the context will bear that out. Now, drop down to number question 14. In what sense did the Father make Jesus to be sin for us? We should never think that Jesus became the worst sinner ever. No, he didn't become a sinner. In what sense did God make him to be sin for us? Now, let me give you, can I have 80 seconds? Okay, I'm down to 77. Look in Ephesians chapter 2. Let me give you a different word, but let me just say it this way. Think of something in the Old Testament. Okay? Ephesians 2, verse 13 talks about in Christ. And then verse 14 says, 
for he is our peace. If you think in Old Testament, Jesus was, so to speak, given as a peace what? Offering. I think that's your meaning in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. He was offered as a sin offering. There's that Old Testament concept. Sin offering to bring the people together with God. He didn't become a sinner. Does the Bible say that our sins were laid on Him? Yes. What is it? Isaiah 53. Wounded for our transgressions. Right? Our sins or iniquities were laid upon Him. The Bible says He bore our sins in the sense that He did what? He stood in our place. Right? He stood in our place. When you and I deserved eternal punishment. That's what God's justice cries for. But God's mercy said there's a way out. He was a, a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, in the Old Testament, God said, I don't want those critters that got, you know, two legs that should, when they should have four. I don't want those with disease and spots. I want your best. And that's what Jesus was. I'm going to let you do number 15. I, I know you got that. The purpose of Him being made sin, well, why did Jesus give His life? In general terms, if we were studying Second Corinthians, somebody says, why did Jesus give His life? So we could have eternal life. Think about the irony of that, y'all. He died so you and I could live. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And you know what else is wonderful? If one of us will remember three weeks from now, we'll have a class again and I'll give you back three minutes. Okay. I've, I've enjoyed it and I've outdone myself. I've talked till dark. <laughs>